Well, hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Or if you're new here, then welcome to my channel. So, what I'm going to be doing, oh, I forgot the bloody spoons. Nope, never mind, I did bring them out with me. So what I'm going to be doing today is showing you how I carve one of these. Now this is what I call a Berkovic spoon. It's a spoon based off of multiple spoons from within the Viking Age. This is one, it's this, this particular one is carved out of spalted beech. You'll have to excuse the wind noises, it's a very windy day. So I made my own template for this one. As I say, inspired by multiple spoons from the Viking Age. That's the, that's the side profile. I quite, I have one of these myself. In fact, I've got two. I have two of these myself and my fiancé Morgan, soon to be wife, has three that she's claimed because she really likes them and she keeps claiming them, the really good ones. <laughs> Which is fine by me because I, I love that she loves the work I do. Where's the longer one gone? Where is it? I've also done this one not too long ago. Bit of a longer one, more of a serving spoon I suppose than an actual soup spoon. Or a cooking spoon if you like. These are all of course for sale, so if you'd like to buy one, please contact me. Uh, what I'm going to be showing you today is how I would carve one of those. It's not strictly speaking a how-to. Um, I There are many, many ways of carving spoons. You can do it with axes and knives. You can do it with draw knives and gouges on a... Sh on a um, I've forgotten the name of it. Spoon mule, that's the one. I do have a spoon mule, but it's broken. I'm not going to be using that today, but... I'll be using the technique or showing you the technique of how to do it with very sort of bare minimum tools and equipment that you would need in order to get into this weird and wonderful world that is spoon carving. So let's let's dive in. First of all, tools. The very basics of spoon carving tools you will need. An axe, a straight knife or sloyd knife as people call them, a hook knife, a pencil and a template. Or if you'd like to do your spoons freehand and just make it up as you go along, which I've done for quite a while. And I found is it kind of works, it kind of doesn't. Depends on the person really, I suppose. Then buy, use, a, use a template or not. It's up to you. There's only really, I'm going to say this now before I forget, there's only really one correct way of doing of spoon carving, and that is doing it safely. Now, I'm going to do my very best to sort of show you the safe ways of doing this, but there might be one or two things that I miss. So don't take everything I say as absolute gospel or canon on this. Look up other videos. Uh, Zed Outdoors has a great YouTube um, channel on spoon carving with lots of different people and how they carve spoons. Rise Up and Carve on Zoom. If you look up Rise Up and Carve on uh, Instagram, then you can find the the zoom meeting address and have a chat with people and and you know get some sort of opinions and feedback or whatever as you go along I've, I've been on there quite a bit or not as much as i would like to lately but a fair amount and over time and uh it's a really good resource yeah and instagram of course there's loads of people on instagram who have excellent feeds they have excellent videos and pictures and they might give hints and tips or they should be happy to share any information they have now advanced tools, if you want to call them advanced tools, so that's the very basic is axe, straight knife, hook knife, pencil and template. That's the template I'm going to be using today. On top of that, might be a good idea to get yourself a saw of some kind. This is from Axminster. I forget the name of the brand. I think it's Zed. Yeah, Zed, made in Japan. 25 quid, 270 mil long blade, enough for spoon carving. As you can see, it's slightly bent because I've had this quite a while and I get a little bit gung-ho with it on occasion. <laughs> um, so that's that's a very helpful thing to have. Also, for splitting logs, if you're going to do it the way I'm going to show you today, you'll need another axe because I don't use your carving axe that you spend good money on. This is a wood tools one, no relation by the way. And the, wood, and the curved knife, the hook knife I have is a wood tools one as well. Don't go hit in the back of your carving axe if you can help it, because you could spread the eye. Now the eye is the bit with the wood slots into, or the socket if you will. You could spread that and then the head comes loose and you've got to go through all sorts of all sorts of things to try and get that tight again. So try not to hit your the back of your carving axe on, on the pole, which is that bit at the back. Get a cheap one off eBay. This was, I forget how much, the, the handle is on the verge of breaking as you can see. But I'm quite happy to hit the pole of this. It's not come loose actually, which is odd. I'm quite happy to hit this 
all day long. It's not sharp by any means. It doesn't need to be supremely sharp for splitting logs. You also want then a nice big mallet. Now this is my one. So that's a piece of ash, which is a piece of ash branch, I think. Oh no, I did cleave that out. And then a great big lump of ash, but it's very, very knotty to try and stop it from splitting apart too much as I'm whacking things with it. As you can see, it's had a bit of abuse. Um, yeah, it's not too difficult to make yourself a mallet, or you can just get a, a joiner's mallet from Wilco. That will have enough punch behind it. Good things to have. What you could also use for splitting is a fro. I have a fro because I do chairs as well. This is good for more long, thin pieces of wood. It's what they're more designed for is long, thin pieces rather than massive, huge rounds that you're going to try and get lots of spoons out of. So you could get one of them. I personally don't use it for my spoon carving stuff. I just use the axe because uh, and a wedge as well where's my wedge there it is there's a very beaten up seasoned beach wedge which has been in constant use for years so that's had a good old kick in i've had this for about four years now and it's still going so not bad but that's your that's essentially what you're going to need tool wise as well as the tools that i've just shown you you also want to get yourself or make yourself a nice chopping block now this one is a piece of sycamore on the top I think it's sycamore anyway, it could be ash now I think about it. And ooh, ash legs possibly. And essentially what I've done here, or what I have done here is drilled holes in the bottom and then worked the ends of the legs down, smacked them in, that's it. It has got a line on the top here, a little groove, which was put in when the tree was cut down, which is actually quite useful for holding a the billet against when you're axing away so that's quite a sort of a good thing to try and do is to try and cut so far down if you get yourself something like this and then have some sort of ridge to hold your billet against as you're axing that's a i found that to be really good you don't have to have it on legs it could just be on the floor you don't have to put legs on it. you could sit yourself on like a nice stool or a chair and do your axing that way but in between your legs just be aware that you do have the uh, very important artery running up your legs and try not to hit that another thing that might be a good idea as a beginner kevlar gloves cut proof kevlar gloves these are not overly expensive they're about five or six quid a pair you're best off as well using them or holding them having it on the hand that doesn't have the tool in so for my case i'm right handed it should go on the left hand so i don't know why i put it on the right hand you'd hold your hold the spoon you're working on in your left hand, tool in the right hand, you shouldn't really cut your, yourself if you're doing it properly with the hand that's holding the tool. But if you really want to do it with have Kevlar gloves on both hands, carry on. You know, do it however you want. So that's important. Also, plasters and some tissue because no matter how good at this you get, you will cut yourself at some point. I say that it's very important and you shouldn't cut yourself. We all have little accidents, we all get complacent at some point, it happens, we're only human, we make mistakes. So plasters and tissue, very good to have to hand, or if it's quite severe, steri strips. Try not to do it so badly that you do need stitches. <laughs> I've not done that to myself yet, but I have seen other people do it. But don't let that put you off. If you're wearing the Kevlar gloves as a beginner, then you shouldn't have that issue. If you're more advanced on watching this, and you are cutting yourself quite a bit maybe think about how you're doing it try to keep your fingers and your thumb and other parts of your hands out of the way of the edge tools because these things are very very sharp and it's actually more dangerous in my opinion and i know a lot of people share this opinion to have a blunt tool than a sharp one i know that sounds ridiculous but when the tool itself is actually blunt that's my more a 120 i think it is I've got a 106, one a longer blade one, on the way I have ordered it, but it hasn't turned up yet because Christmas. Ooh, big gust of wind. But if these are blunt or dull, you're then going to end up forcing them through the cut in the wood. And if and when they slip, the damage to you can be quite severe. So it may sound really silly that it's a bad idea to have sharper tools, but it's actually more safe. So this is my my wood tools um, compound curve. I think it's a compound curve anyway. Uh, Right-handed hook knife. These are not overly expensive, but they're not necessarily cheap either. And I would personally avoid anything that seems to be incredibly cheap when it comes to tools. You can get stuff that's reasonably good for a very good price. In fact, you can get tools that are very, very good 
for a very good price. Like these Mora knives only cost about 23, 24 pounds delivered in the UK. These are the ones that most people use starting off. Either the 120 like this or the 106, which is a little bit longer. I would go for the 120 as a beginner because it's a, lot, a shorter blade. You're less likely to end up cutting yourself because you don't have so much blade protruding from the spoon you're working on. As I say, that's a wood tools compound curve right hand hook knife. That's the shape of it. Nice shiny bevel, nice and sharp. I sharpened these the other day. I won't show the sharpening in this video because it's not a sharpening video, it's a spoon carving video. That's the wood tools axe, comes with the sheath. You have to do have to pay a little extra for it, but it's well worth having it because it protects the edge of the axe and it protects you as well if you're thumbling around in your little tool case or box like I've got. That's nice and sharp as well. So that's tools, bit of safety talk. What kinds of wood should I use for spoon carving? Generally speaking, hardwoods are the best. So what I mean by hardwood is anything with a broad leaf that sheds its leaves in autumn, stroke winter, and then they regrow again in spring. That's a hardwood. A softwood is a coniferous wood, so it'll have needles. There are exceptions to this, such as larch, which is technically a hardwood, even though it has needles, it actually sheds them come autumn and then regrows them again in spring. Don't ask me why that is, it's just the way they do it. Who knows what trees are really up to. But some of my personal favourite woods are, of course, beech. Here's a couple of beech spoons. That's a Welsh cow spoon. That's one of the longer Birkovic spoon. Here's a bit of a close-up for you of them. So that's a Welsh cow spoon that I do. That's the Birkovic spoon side profiles. So that's beech. Um, what else have I got in here? I've got some cherry plum. This was stuff as hard as hell. <laughs> I'll try to, I'll try to uh, let it mellow out a fair bit more before I uh, carve with this again. Oh, it was like a rock. That's like a big serving spoon type thing. There's some cherry in here somewhere. Oh, I sold it, didn't I? There's another beech one. It's like a weird serving spoon thing that I really should use instead of just leaving it in my basket. Uh, cherry. Let's try something made of cherry. Uh, is that cherry? That looks like cherry. Could be. Yeah, that's a little cherry coffee spoon. That's just a bit of fun. Nothing too serious. That was just something to make quickly one day. Not a bad profile. Good length for stirring your coffee and sugar into or a cup of tea, whatever you want to do it. A cup of soup. Uh, there's alder. That's another Birkovic spoon. That's some spalted alder. That's common alder that's spalted as well. It's just spalting on the handle. Weird how there's nothing in here. But there we go. That's a... That's a nice sort of close green. It's, it's, the close grained woods is what you want. Something where you can look at the... Try and find a good bit of end grain. Where you can see that the... Because the grain going up the wood is like little straws. And you want them as tight and close packed together as possible. Now some people say that ash is good enough or very good for carving spoons from. I personally don't like it for carving spoons. That's another cherry plum one which I finished the other day. That's like a Swedish sort of influenced modern Swedish or semi-modern Swedish eating spoon that I do. Quite like doing them, they're, they're a bit of fun. Uh, ah, some cherry. That's another kind of Viking spoon, which I won't be doing today. But um, that's a Viking era influenced sort of spoon. That's cherry. That's nice colours. Cherry, beech, alder. Alder I find a little bit soft, perhaps, but definitely cherry and beech have been my favourites so far. I have used a uh, lime or linden. I don't have the cup out here with me, but I do have a lime uh, drinking cup, as you would imagine a drink a cup which should be used for drinking, um, in the house. Which, as I say, I don't have it out here with me. What I do have is one of the cherry cups which I carved a little while ago. It's a nice little fun, <laughs> full ow in my eyes. Nice little fun projects. These are a bit more tricky than a spoon because you've got to get all the green direction right in the bowl there but that's a uh, that's cherry that's what cherry can look like you can see a pattern here i suspect cherry beach something a bit more close green than either of them the cherry plum which i've got what else have i got in here no it's all just uh beach cherry plum cherry and that's about it so those are the kinds of woods that i would advise so you've got things like beach cherry alder um linden or lime there there's a good one birch willow is quite soft but you do need really really sharp tools unless you leave it to as they say mellow for a while which you just paint the ends of the log with 
bit of PVA glue, keep it under cover somewhere out of the wind, rain and sunlight and it will sort of harden up over time. It's a little bit more pleasant to carve then. It's not quite so stringy and weird. It's willow and poplar. I hate poplar. I mean, that sounds strange maybe coming from a woodworker, but I really do dislike carving poplar. It's just horrible. I've not had good experiences with it whatsoever. I, I just want to avoid it at all costs. So I don't tend to touch it, but beech, cherry, alder, linden is quite nice. Birch is quite nice. Sycamore and maple can be a bit hard for a beginner. I am going to be using sycamore today because it's what I've got. It's nice and fresh and should carve a bit easier than when it's sort of been laying around for a while, like some of the stuff in the shed. Because, you know, life happens and you can't always get to the spoon carving you want to do. There is the sycamore log, which I will be writhing in a minute and showing you. It's a good size, this one, as you can see. And put my, it's heavy as well, as you can probably hear. There's my hand next to it. Should be able to get a fair few spoons out of that, but I will only be showing you one. Today I'm not going to go carving a whole load of, um, so probably eight or ten spoons I could get out of this. But I'll just be showing you the one, I'll do the other ones, as time allows. So let's get on with that next. Let's get our log on the floor. Oh, she's a brute. So what I'm looking to do, I don't know if you can see it, so I'll zoom in. But there's already a crack just there, and that's usually a good indicator of where to split your, or start your split. So I might follow that and try and keep it in line with that and it might split straight. This is one of the, the wonderful things about working with uh, with wood, and especially when it's sort of fairly fresh and green, as we call it. Um, it will basically do whatever it wants. Right, so I'm gonna follow that split instead of going down that way. I'm gonna go that way because that's the way the wood tends to want to naturally split as it's drying. So I'm gonna follow that. Hold the handle with the ax at the end like so. So what I'm going to do is hold the axe at the end of the handle like so, place the blade on the edge of the axe or the bit along that, that line that's already started to crack and give it a little a couple of little taps just to get a, a line going like so. Like I said earlier I don't really care about this particular axe because it was very cheap off eBay I've been whacking it for months, so it's not going to make any difference now. Now notice how I've got the axe, so if it swings out, it's not going towards me. It's going off to the side where there's no one stood. If there are people around, try and keep a, a safe cordoned off area where people aren't going to walk into the path of your axe. So I've got it going away from me, there's no one else in this shed because you couldn't fit anyone else in here. Certainly not enough room to uh, do any ballroom dancing, that's for sure. So I've got a nice line scored along there now. This is so heavy, it kind of moves but doesn't want to. So I'm going to go back into the centre. I'm going to go a good couple of smacks. Volume warning. It's maybe a bit stubborn coming apart. Quite often logs are, they don't always want to play. Try and get some deeper... That's going into the end green here with the axe. There we go. Where I've split it, so it's an even amount of wood, it's split fairly straight and fairly clean. It's split fairly straight, it has sort of twisted a little bit, but that's kind of to be expected. Especially when the wood hasn't grown evenly. So I've got two there now, I've got two halves. I'm going to use this one. It doesn't really matter which one because they've both got knots in them. There's a knot on this one, but there. And there's a knot on this one, but there, like a hidden knot, an inclusion. So it doesn't matter which one I use, neither, neither of them are either cleaner or worse than the other. So, put that one to one side. Now I'm going to quarter this one. Because we haven't got an even round half circle piece of wood, I'm going to I'm going to try and split it that way. So that's into a quarter, and then going that way to make an eighth. Probably I'll get two, two spoons out of that. So, down at the quarters now. You see how the grain's quite nice and straight? That's what I'm going for. Now I like to carve my spoons from radial clefts. This is a piece of ash 
which is which I've cleft out for a spoon and then didn't like it, so I've let it dry out. This is what you call a radial cleft. Like I said I didn't really like carving a spoon from ash, so I haven't done that. I haven't carried on with it. But you might have a different experience. You might really enjoy it. I personally didn't, so I've not been doing it. So I'll turn now into an eighth. Like so. A bit easier now because there's less material to try and split apart. So there we've got ourselves an eighth. No inclusions. Yes, it has twisted a little bit. It's not a massive problem. But I don't need a huge, enormous piece of wood like this to get a spoon out of. As you can see, the spoon is not particularly wide, it's not particularly deep compared to the rest of this, so you only really, an area kind of like, it's not going to show is it, like that. So I can split all this off here along this line, split all that off and then I can do the rest with an axe. Take off this uh, one, one part of it to try and create a triangle, uh, rectangle, or what looks something like a rectangle. Behave. There we go, like that. That's about as wide as you really need it. But that I could probably split that in half. Right down there. The template itself, that's the length of the piece of wood we've got. There's the template. Now it looks a bit maybe wasteful to use all that length of wood. However, if your log has been sat around for a while, it will develop checks or cracks or splits in the end like this. This is a piece of cherry. I'll be using for those nice drinking cups. Now you can see how the ends, that one hasn't split so much, but this one has. Now those checks fair, might go in a fair way, so it might come up to here, in which case all this piece of wood here is actually no good because it's all split and checked and it will come apart over time. Similar at this end, I'd probably have to lose three inches off each end. So it's okay, and it's a good idea to start off your your spoon blank with a much longer piece of wood than you need. And now that I've got the template out, I can roughly draw, I can draw on there now where I want to split off the bark side and where I'm going to split off. Leave yourself plenty of space and plenty of wiggle room and material to play with because you can always take some off but you can't put it back on. I know that wood glue exists before anyone, <laughs> before anyone screams it at their, at their TV or computer or phone or tablet but yeah, you don't want to go to using wood glue on spoons, it's just a bad idea. Probably get two out of this actually, because this hasn't checked on the on the on the end grain. I might be able to get two out of it. Yeah, I will. <laughs> that's good. So that's where I'm gonna split. Now you see how the split has wandered off this way? That's because there's not an even amount of wood. That was what I was meaning to, to try and get across. When splitting the whole log out into half to try and and quarters and eighths, try and keep it even so that the split goes straight. Because if you have less material here, more material there, it's going to have an uneven tension. The split's going to want to wander where there's less tension. So that's why it's gone that way. Just take that out, turn it upside down, and then try and stand it up like so. Don't try and grab the piece if it falls. You can rest your axe on it like that and try and keep it steady and stable. Give it a whack. That's okay. As long as you've got bits, of, that's the safer way I find to do it than necessarily than to try and do it with the hand axe because you do have to put a fair amount of effort into getting that much material off. And if you're fairly new to axing, you want to try and do as little with the carving hatchet as possible. So I will only get one out of this just to show you the technique of using a longer piece of wood. Uh, to get one spoon so you can cut the ends off and do it in a more safe manner. It keeps your fingers away from the sharp edge of the axe. Now we have our piece of cleft wood. A bit thinner on this end, a bit wider on that end. Get your template and just have a look. So you've still got plenty of room at that top end to get your, your spoon template on there. But I would suggest to a beginner and give yourself a bit more room and I'll put the template down this end. Draw roughly where I can remove material with the pencil. Sycamore's a fairly sort of but close grained wood, quite pretty. So what I'm going to do is brace the billet against the chopping block and I'm going to sight down from the top and I'm going to put some stop cuts in coming in from the side like so and then go straight down.
remember I said about how that ridge there can be helpful in supporting your billet it really has helped at this point now a big thing to take note of is try not to go all the way up to the top here with your axing only go about two thirds of the way up because your hand's up here and you'd like to try and keep your hand I suspect where it is on the end of your arm but if you need to cut that high up all you got to do flip it over and then just take that last bit off like so now when it comes to holding an axe you don't have to grip it so your knuckles go white all you need is that these are the three fingers are there purely to stabilize it if anything you want a little bit of a little bit of movement in your in your motion like so you don't want to be holding on to it and white knuckle because that's just going to end up hurting your hand in the long run so what i'm going to do now is try and level up this piece it's much thicker on this edge than it is here so i'm going to try and level it up so stop cuts like so tilting the piece of wood and then change the angle of the piece of wood. Try not to change the angle of what your axe is striking. Try to change the angle of your billet. That way, oh, and keep your, your elbow tucked into your side. Don't have your elbow wag waggling around because your axe is going to go everywhere then. Keep your elbow tucked in and keep it in your axe in the line of sight with your eyes and just take off little bits if you want. Creep up on it. Don't try to take off too much at once because you'll just end up maybe going too far creep up on it you can always take more off you can't put more on it's not exactly what i call straight but it's not doesn't really matter at this point as long as it's somewhat near fairly straight See that lovely green? That's a nice sick noise. I'll take a bit off this side as well because this is obviously the rough craft side from the other side of the log. So stop cuts going in and then change the angle of the wood. And that's down to where you want to be. Another way to do it, as I've just done there, not putting any stop cuts in and just almost using the axe like a plane to go down as such and that's a good thickness I'll try and get that I'm still quite twisted get rid of that bit there you want to try and use the axe in a slicing motion rather than just a, like a that Try and use it as a slicing motion because the blade is curved, it works best in a slicing action or motion like that. Try to do that rather than just going like this. Try to do it in a slicing, easy going action. Try to practice it if you can on your chopping block and let the axe wave that little bit in your hand and you'll get a better feel for it then when it's going to striking your your billet your piece of wood as such it's a bit thick on this end thick by there so again i'm not going too high up I'm not going any more than two thirds up with my axe my hands up here holding it down and pressing it into the chopping block. I don't want to cut the thumb off. You'll hear many horror stories of uh, people cutting themselves in spoon carving. It's not pretty, but it does make you realize that it can be very, if you're doing it properly, it's not dangerous. But of course, like I said earlier, we are only, only, only human and we do make mistakes. And another thing I want to highlight is my stance as I'm doing this. I've got my dominant foot, which is my right foot, behind me because I'm right-handed and my non-dominant leg is in front of me and I'm kind of in an almost starting to lunge kind of stance. I've got my elbow tucked in, right hand on the axe, elbow tucked in 
And what's going to happen, the reason I've got that leg back there, is if I miss the billet and the axe misses the block, it's going to come out into fresh air. It's not going to come out into my leg. Hopefully not going to come out into someone behind you. Be aware of people or animals or children around you. But the reason that that stance is good is so if you miss and you do miss the block, the axe is going to end up in fresh air and not in you. Try as well to keep your billet as far over to the far side of the block as you can as well. Because what happened then is if you do miss, it hits the block. If you go back over here and you miss, chances are it's going to miss the block. And if you're not standing properly, it's going to hit you. Billet as far over as you can get it. Dominant foot, which for me is my right foot, if you're left handed, it'd be your left foot behind you in a sort of starting to lunge kind of stance. Elbow in. Let the axe freely rock in your hands. Don't grip it with these three fingers too tight. Just let it gently rock in a slicing motion, and that's the best way to do the axing. And also, don't forget to blow or remove the debris off the top of your block because you don't want all this stuff hanging around on top because it could cause your billet to slip and then accidents can happen. That's also a bad habit because you could all, uh, I have really got a break because you could have a lot of debris and crap in the end green of your block. You really want to try and avoid doing that. When you finish with your axe, put it back in its sheath or cover or whatever it's got with it and put it to one side. You don't need it. Keep it to one side covered. So if it drops off the bench or off the chair next to you in your kitchen or whatever, it's not going to hit you or anyone else. We'll get on to next drawing on the template. Right, the next step is to get your template and draw it on. Now, I've got a very long piece of wood here. And I'm going to put it here. And the reason I'm going to put it here is so that I can cut. I've got space to cut that off level afterwards and so that I can hold the workpiece. Because one thing we're going to be doing is axing down that way with the axe going down the handle and into some of the bowl, which I'll show you in a minute. So I want to have room to hold my hand up here and not have the risk of me catching my hand, the axe on the blade onto my hands. Because if I cut this piece of wood that long, this pencil is rubbish. Where's the other one? Aha! So if I cut, cut the piece of wood that long, when I'm going to then axe down this way, I've got to hold my thumb right exactly almost where I'm axing, and that's dangerous. I've also put that mark there so I can see roughly where the spoon template's going to go. It's going to go about there. That seems like a good, good place for it. Place the template roughly where I want it. I'll cut this off level across here in a second with the saw. You don't necessarily have to, but I'm going to. You could use, and people do use, uh, a Sharpie pen, you know, the markers. But I don't like using them. I like using pencil. I find that the Sharpie tends to come off all over my fingers and I end up with like red or green or black fingers. It makes a bit of a mess, I find. So I just use pencil. Watercolour pencils are good for this. They're good for drawing on fresh, fairly fresh wood. Let's draw the lines on a bit clearer so I can definitely see them. I'm going to get my saw. I'm just going to lock the end off there. I'm just going to cut that level. Fish. And then what I'm going to do, what I like to do, is have the change in the bowl, because I like the bowl to have a slight bit of tilt to it. So I tend to cut the bowl, or now cut across the bowl about there. You'll see the reason for this in a second. Just put a pencil line there so I can see where to put my saw. Start on the back corner, somewhere near where the pencil line is. It doesn't have to be exactly on it. Just make sure it's square across the bowl. And then lower the back of the saw down so both sides are both. I'm getting a nice square cut. I'm just going to nibble away gently and then have a quick look. Now you don't have to go down very far. You don't want to go down too far as well because you don't want to end up with what's called short grain where you have a lots of uh, the area here on the spoon or there will have a very will have a lot of crank to it so the crank of the spoon is how much it sweeps from down the handle and up the bowl you don't want it to be too steep because you end up with what's like I said short grain or you end up with this is a, not as extreme a, uh, an example but you still got a nice amount of grain going up the length of the wood there going that way so that's nice and strong Whereas if you had it too steep, like the bowl was sort of like that where my hand is, you've got a very short grain there, it's going to be very, very weak. So you don't want that, so you don't want to go too deep. Remember, you're trying to put food in your face, you're not trying to scoop out a load of soup from a 
a big cooking pot with a ladle. You're not making a ladle, this is just a simple soup or eating spoon. Just go a little bit deeper, maybe five or six mil. Blow the sawdust off of your top of your block because that, that is an abrasive and it will ruin the edge on your axe. Now you'll see where my thumb is all the way up there. Can't quite get it all in the camera shot. Where my thumb's all the way up here. And I'm going to be axing from there down to this stop cut because this is what this is for. This is so I can start putting the angle or the crank of the spoon into the billet like so. So I'm going to go down there and then I'm going to change it over to this way and come in like that with the axe, which I'll show you in a second. What I'm going to do is just put some stop cuts in and then from the top of the handle Start taking pieces away. You've really got to go gently at this point. You don't have to go nuts. You can just use the axe to lever out, like so, any material that hasn't quite come off. You see how the how the, the cut as I'm striking down is not going any further than that stop? And that's why we put a saw cut in there, so you can start to create the crank. Little taps. Choke up on the on the axe so you put your handle your your hand further up the handle. And just little gentle nibbles. Think of like a hamster nibbling on a carrot rather than a lion chomping down a piece of gazelle. It's probably a bad analogy, but you get what I mean. It's a spoon, it's not the animal kingdom. and create a nice flat surface right remember about keeping the piece of wood you're working on fairly far away from you down the block and that way if you do miss the piece of wood with your axe it's not going to end up in you just take a little bit more off the back of here just to square it up a touch now this is where things change i'm going to move the chopping block a bit further away so what i'm going to do now is actually come across the grain to create the crank of the bowl. So I'm going to be cutting up that way. And this is what I mean about how you don't want too much crank in your spoon because you can see there's a very short piece of grain. The length of the grain there is going to be quite short and then gets longer. That's the short grain I was talking about. You don't want it in your handle. You don't want too much in the end of your bowl because it's fragile, it's weak, and it won't, won't stay there. It'll easily snap off. So I'm just going to Going down the side. Now I know that the across the green. Now I know that the piece of wood is on the near side of the block to me. But if I miss now, we're doing little strikes. It should then dig into the block and not into me. But I have got my legs in that position. I talked about that earlier. So choke up on the on the axe. Get your hand right up underneath the underneath the head and just. Gently, slowly, don't go mad with it. You can push the, instead of changing the position of your axe, keep your elbow in and keep the axe striking in the same part of the block and move the billet up and down as you need to. Your muscle memory will, will develop over time doing this. You don't need to worry about that immediately. Keep the axe in the same place and move the billet rather than try and move the axe. That way your arm stays in the same place and you should get good repetition in your axe strikes. Because that's very important is to repeatedly get the same strike in the same place. Otherwise you end up with the spoon going all over the shop. Now, I don't know how well you can see that, but this flat surface here is fairly square with that flat surface. And that's what you want, otherwise you end up with a twisted spoon. Which can actually look quite nice and I, I do quite often do that, but... Yeah, by accident more than on purpose. So now I'm going to redraw the template back on. You'll have to do this a couple of times, in fact. It won't just be once, it'll be maybe two or three times. At least twice. Definitely twice. As you can see, there it is again. So now you can see why my hand was all the way up here. And I didn't cut it off down there immediately. 
and then doing I'm doing this so for to show beginners as well. So I don't want people to see it as a because it is a bad habit to cut your billet level and then strike down right behind your thumb. It's not a great idea, even when you're experienced, because like I said, we're only human and we do make mistakes and it's easy enough to have that one axe strike go in the wrong place to get quite a severe laceration in your thumb. What I am going to do now though is cut that off there and I'll use this as another another blank, another billet. So I'll cut it off across behind the handle. Right, off you come. Thank you. So what I'm going to do next is I am going to cut in some saw stops, stop cuts here, down across the grain and towards the back of the bowl, nicely behind the bowl. You could even put in two if you really want to. I quite often do this when I haven't done any spoon carving for a while, just so I can, uh, it's a bit more of a safety stop. So what I'm going to do is cut the saw down that line. And you don't have to go right the way up to your pencil line. You don't need to do that. So I've stopped short of the pencil line there. I'm going to do it on this side as well. Because yeah, you're going to do the knife work anyway, and the neck of the, uh, the neck of the spoon will end up being narrower than this anyway. I just draw them wider than they need to be in the template, and when I put the template on, just to give me that bit of wiggle room. Like I say, you can always take some off, so you can't put it back on. Second one. Stop and short the template line. Blow your block off. And there you have it. What you could do is then axe down what you don't need of this material here from here. I don't like to do that. So what I'm going to do is actually... Could do with the camera in a different place really. So you fill it a nice distance away from you on the block so that if you do miss the axe buries into the block and don't forget to keep your legs in that sort of half lunge position we talked about earlier. As you can see I'm starting to work my way down now. I'll just turn it over and take the bit of material away from the side of the bowl that doesn't need to be there like so. Try not to go over the over the line or too close to it you can always go at that with a knife not the axe and what i'm going to do now because i've got a nice bit of material i'm going to take a bit more away from there actually just little nibbly strikes remember like a hamster nibbling on a carrot and then i'm going to start striking down this way you can see why i put the saw stops in in a second there you go like that so as you strike down a piece will probably break off and when it gets that saw stop, that's where, as far as the split goes, that's, all, that's what it's there for. It's a safety barrier. I'm going to start nibbling in the side here now. You don't have to do that bit with the axe if you're a beginner, but I've got a fair bit of experience now. So just little gentle hamster nibbles, like so. And I'm going to turn it back over. Axe down and weigh material. Put some stop cuts in there and axe away the material like so. I will not put the saw cuts in there, the stop cuts with your axe, and just follow the cuts down with the blade. Some people do it that way. This is what I mean. There's, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to spoon carving as long as you're doing it safely. Now I'm gonna, you can't see it, but I'm gonna just take away. Down the side of the handle going this way gently just dropping the axe gently this is one of those times you can just drop the axe straight down you don't want to give it too much welly and just hope that the like that see how that chip just flew off there that's because the split went down to the saw cut and it didn't go off down the bowl and into the bowl and cut your bowl off you don't want that and i've done that many times lately it happens even when you've got a fair bit of experience it'll happen to you i'm sure those of you who are new to this and watching so now that i've cut the width down of the handle where i want it to be without going too far in towards these lines what i can do next is 
take more material off the side of this bowl on this side so that doesn't need to be there now take that away not going right up to the line just don't need to at this point next thing i'm going to do is start creating a chamfer on the back of the bowl on each side I'm trying to follow this line here and this sycamore is still fairly fresh so it's a little bit slippery but take your time and try and keep the these cuts or the, the angle of these chamfers nice and even you can correct it afterwards with your knife if you want to it's not the end of the world if you don't get it exactly symmetrical with the axe Good, and then I'll take a bit off the end there, like so. Right, okay. Now there's a bit of a tricky bit. I'm going to try, I'm going to take a bit more off the back of the bowl there, actually, and a bit more. Just creep up on it. Don't go, don't go all out, guns blazing, trying to make a... Trying to make an exact perfect spoon with your axe immediately because the chances are you won't. I'm going to take a bit more off there actually. A bit thick on that side. Just creep up on it. Go gentle. You don't have to, you're not going to win any prizes for being the fastest spoon carver in the world. You've got two sharp corners here. Spoon down like this. And I'm going to come across, can you see that? I'm going to hold the spoon down with, with my thumb, and I'm just going to saw across, across the front of the bowl, take these corners off, like that. These saws are nice and quick. Try not to catch your hands on them, because they're very, very, very brutal. This thing's had me multiple times. That gives me the chance now to rest a spoon like this, and use the axe to just nibble away that corner there, keeping your elbow in, and just try to stay away from the line as much as you can with the axe. Don't have to go right the way up to it. Put it against the, the ridge on the block there, keep it steady. Steady-ish. Just little taps to nibble taps with the axe. I'm going to come across the front of the bowl. Now I'm going to do the same on this side. You can't see it and I can barely see it. Go to kind of trust yourself on this at this point. Trying to make a, a nice, decent, clean cut, straight line, like so. And then if you want to, you get that little bit at the end, you can just use the axe as a bit of a lever and just come across it, putting the heel of the axe, so that's the heel, that's the toe, putting the heel of the axe in the block and then just use it like, like a lever, like so. Right. So I was supposed to show you taking off the material that was left here, which was fairly square, kind of like that. However, I didn't press record on the camera because I'm a total tit. So what I did do, I'll tell you now, is I held the piece where I've got that ridge along here on the block. I held it down with my thumb and I used the saw to take out that corner going that way. And move my hand here and go in that way, taking little nibbles, a little bit at a time, not going mad. You don't want to end up with that saw going into the side of your hand because it will bloody hurt. And that's how you take off with a saw without an axe. If you don't want to do it with the axe, that's absolutely fine. I quite often do. Of course, you don't have to do it with the axe. You can do it with a saw. That's what is more comfortable for you and easier. And if it's easier, do it. And if it's safer, definitely do it. So there you go we've chased around the bowl now you can see that what i'm going to do next is actually take the material off the back of the handle so i'm just going to draw a line on with a pencil to roughly where i want the you can do this when you're when you're doing it yourself if you want to give this a go draw the line on sort of roughly you can tidy it up with a knife afterwards and you can see then how the bowl's angled this way and the handle's going to be angled that way. That's the crank I was talking about. So it's a nice, comfortable sort of dimension or ergonomic feeling when you're using it to eat with. Because that's what we want. We want it to be comfortable. We want it to be nice. We want it to be a good experience. So 
because an uncomfortable spoon is a shit spoon. Now what I'm going to do is actually take this down in thirds. So I'm going to take off a third there, a third there, take that corner off, that corner off, and come down the middle. Rather than trying to take it all off, because that's a fair amount of material to take off in one, you might not get it totally square. You want to try and keep it as square as you can. Just take this corner off first, do it in thirds, it's a really good way of doing it, because it's easier to take off this little amount this corner here than all of that. So let's just take off this corner here. Like so. so. Right the way down to the top of the handle. And I'm going to try and match that angle. Going down the other side. Let's see, it doesn't really... As long as you get somewhere near with the axe, it doesn't have to be exactly the same both sides and symmetrical. So you can see that that, that high, line is higher than that one. At least I can take off a little bit more. Just a little bit like so. You should end up with a ridge then going bang down the center. Now I'm going to take that off because you don't need the back of a handle of a spoon to be that thick. So I'm going to take that off. And now you can go down the middle because all you're left with is that little point, a very small amount of material to end up taking off. Which again, like I said, is a lot easier than trying to hoof it all up in one go. You only need light taps. It's less work on your body as well. It's less strain on your hands and on your wrists because you will have a bit of strain on your wrists when axing, first of all. Because your body won't, and your muscles won't be used to it. But they'll build up over time. So there we go. It's a fairly good square straight spoon. If anything, that's probably one of the better ones I've made in a while. <laughs> to be totally honest, because... Sometimes I get a little bit lost in it and I tend to sort of forget to actually try and keep it nice and square and straight and I kind of lose myself in the moment. So I'm just going to take a bit of a bit more material off the bowl here, get away from me. So it's a little bit less knife work in the end. Try and chase the line around sort of thing. It's a nice, there's a nice thickness to the rim there you can see now rather than it being all that material. I'm going to turn the blank over like this. And try and chase that line around again. Where did I start? I get so wrapped up in the talking and distracting, I forget what I'm doing. I'm try and sort of chase it around using the toe now of the axe. There we go. We've got a nice, nice consistent rim there. You could take a bit more off the back of the bowl here with the axe if you wanted, or you could leave it for the knife. Either one doesn't make a doesn't matter. I will do it with the axe though. Just take a little nibble here and a little nibble there and a nibble nibble here a nibble everywhere a nibble nibble. See I'm just taking off little thin shavings, just little little taps with the axe. It's nothing aggressive, it's nothing too much. Just little bits at a time. That's all you need to do. Come on. Just skimming bits off. Yeah, that looks pretty good. It's a nice round bowl. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Okay. Right. I'd say that's ready for the knife work. So we've got our billet here, or our blank. You can still see the lines mostly, so I'm just going to draw them on a little bit stronger, just so I can see them that little bit clearer. Now, I'll work on grain direction. You want to go with the direction of the grain when doing this. You can see the saw cut line there, where I'd put a saw cut in and an axe down here, and then gone that way, going down across the grain. You want to go, and you can always draw this on if you want, while you're doing a bit of knife work or whatever. You want to go that way, put an arrow there. And that way with a knife and then that way to match it up can you see that oh, i can't see because the phone screen's cracked i had to turn, use the other camera on the front but similarly if you go that way while doing around the bowl you actually end up chipping some off you want to go that way because you want to go down the stairs so you can see the grain coming off like that so you want to go down the stairs and when you come to this side you want to go there that way, 
and that way. People do templates where they actually show on the template drawing, you can cut the template out from how to, which direct, direction to go in. Now I'm going to use the potato peeler grip for doing this bit, which is just like peeling a potato with a knife. What you're going to see is happening is I've got the blade grasping these in my fingers like so, and I'm closing my fist to, to get the knife to cut, but I'm also keeping my thumb out of the way. I'm using my thumb to steady the spoon, but as I close my fist and keeping the knife at a slight angle, if you do it like that it isn't going to cut properly, you want the knife at a slight angle, you hear that, it's that zipping sound, that's the sound of a close green wood, a nice sharp knife. As you can see where my thumb is, as the knife comes out of the cut, it isn't going into my thumb, it's going into fresh air. That's where you want it to go. So I'm using the potato peeler grip. We're going around the bowl now. And then I'm going to change grip to the thumb push. So you hold your knife in your dominant hand, you have your thumb up here, keeping your fingers tucked away down there. And then you just give a little a lever and a push with your thumb. It's all very controllable. The idea of all this now is to control where the blade is going. You want to do that with the axe as well. You want to be in full control of where that axe blade is headed. Because if you're not in control of it, accidents will happen. Just take little bits off just to get up to that line. Like so. And then I'm going to change grip again to the finger push. But the blade is actually going to come towards me, but I'm putting equal amount of force behind this hand and this hand to keep the blade in control. There will be a little bit of slippage with it, and it's with these kind of cuts, the potato peeler cut and the finger push cut, as I call it. Other people might call it something different. Well, you might, if you're new to this, you might want to put the Kevlar gloves on, because Especially if you've got the longer Mora 106, this is the 120, the shorter blade. If you've got the 106, which is a longer blade, you might find yourself stabbing yourself or giving yourself a little slice here and there in your, in your holding hand, your spoon holding hand, with the end, edge, end of the blade. Just kind of nicely to the line there, see? I'm going to change the grip again to the thumb push. Like I said before with the axing, if you want to take just corners off, take that corner off, then that corner off, and then meet it in the middle, that works pretty well. I'll we'll try and get into that habit. Take off the corners to where you think it needs to be, and then go into the middle. The best of spoon carvers will, as they say, create some very pretty firewood because you always end up, at some point you will make a little mistake and it will ruin a spoon, no matter how good you get. It happens. There's people I know who have been carving spoons for years and they still do it. So don't feel bad if you accidentally have a little slip here and there and you end up ruining a spoon. If you've got more wood, just start again. If you haven't got a great deal of wood, have a little break from it for a while. Clear your head, have a cup of tea, go for a walk. So I've cleaned up now around the bowl. It seems to be fairly square around the bowl. So what I'm going to do now is bring the spoon up to my chest and I'm going to start to work this material away here. If anything, that's a, it's not quite so square. So I'm going to use now as a chest lever grip. So you have the knife in your hand with a blade facing away from you, spoon in the other hand. Have your elbows out and then bring your elbows in and use the muscles in your back to make a lever. Some people call it the chicken wing grip because you go, I like chicken tonight. Like so, or chest lever grip. And you want to try and get the entire length of the blade to run down your workpiece to create a nice, long, smooth cut. This is the one problem with these shorter knives, and they don't do it quite so well. But you can do it like that. In there, there and there, so I'll just take some more off by there. Okay, 
Now, I'm going to take the material off from here, from the, the neck of the bowl. So I'm using that finger push grip again. I'm using the tip of the blade. This is a nice short distance so I can get that curve going. I'm taking the corner off at the top down to where the line is, roughly. And then, having taken that corner off, I can go on to the other corner. Now the blade is coming towards you, so if you want to put a bib on or some sort of leather apron, that's fine. I'm then going to use the thumb push grip. Take that bottom corner off. And try and match the curve from the template with it. Sycamore's carving lovely. That saw cut has gone a little deeper than I would have liked. So I'm, um, I'm going to have to take a bit more off from here than I wanted to. But that's the way it's gone. Just get rid of that saw cut. See how I'm using the short, the very tip of the blade to go around the corner? That will, because it's shorter, will go round a tight corner. If you try to use that part of the blade, it isn't going to do it because you've got a lot more material, material behind the edge. So you can use the short tip of the blade. Oh, doesn't want to behave, does it? It's like changing green direction there, I think. To just take away the material. Now you could do it with the finger push, as I call it, or you could do it with the thumb push. I'm also going to take away a little bit of material off the side of the bowl here. So keeping the blade at an angle, try and run the blade with your fingers, push on the back of these fingers, and also having this hand pushing back a little bit so you don't end up just with the blade flying into you. But also the safe part about this cut is my fist, the back of my fist is also hitting my body and the blade is pointing away, away from me. So although I'm cutting towards myself, the blade is pointing away from me. So it's actually very safe. Take a little bit off this side as well. Use the thumb push to get a, a thing going on at the top. So I can get the blade, blade in by there. And I can use a bit of a, use the hand push to just come down the side of what's going to be the handle. And like so. Don't worry about getting it absolutely smooth straight away. That will come with practice. Now, I could use the, the finger push here take away that material. It's going to be a little awkward. I'll give it a go, but I've only got the very tip of the blade going in there. And I can turn the spoon slightly. Take away that little bit. What you could also do though, is use your thumb push grip to just gently take away into the curve that you've drawn on with the template and then change grip if you want to and use the finger push to remove the material following that curve at the top of the neck coming down to the bottom back of the bowl and then a little thumb push just to get away that material there now you might find yourself fighting with it a little bit by here but it will come with experience on how to get a good, smooth, crisp line. Let's say we're not looking to do finishing knife work just yet anyway. This is just sort of the rough carving. So take away a bit more material now. Get rid of that off the back of the bowl. All the while keeping your elbows in. Keep your elbows in. And doing these cuts you'll find if you start having your elbows flapping about all over the place it'll be less controllable and then it becomes dangerous right now i've left the rim fairly thick because after i take material out of the inside of the bowl i will then be coming down the outside of the bowl and taking material off to make it thinner which i've got this reason why i've left it thick now i haven't taken a lot of material off the top of the bowl yet because i will be catching up with that in a minute so that's the large majority of the straight knife work done for the moment a little bit to take off there, which I didn't spot just now. Just take that off and make it a nice 
fairly smooth, consistent surface when I'm hollowing the bowl out. So before I go and hollow the bowl out, I actually, it's the crap pencil, I'll actually draw on the inner part of the rim Try and keep it nice and even distance from the edge of the rim of the spoon. Draw on where I need to take the material from. And there's that saw cut we put in earlier. So there's going to be a little bit of the bowl just in the in that area, and then more, most of it at this end. That, that gives a nice. A nice bowl shape I find. This is my compound curve right handed wood tools one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it against my leg there, the, sp the spoon, have my fingers around it like so, keeping my thumb out of the way, and then I'm going to use the potato peeler grip with the hook knife and keep my right thumb down below the edge of the bowl. If I had it up here, I'm going to hit my thumb every time. Keep it down below the edge of the bowl. Hold the spoon nice and securely and just take out, scoop out the material nice and gently. You don't want to go, you don't want to try and go mad with it immediately. You don't need to. Take little bits out at a time. Remember, hamster nibbles, not lion chunks. Don't worry about getting the perfect smooth bowl at the minute. In fact, it's going to be a little bit rough inside anyway. I don't, that's just how I like to make them. But keep it in mind as well, grain direction. Remember I said earlier how with the grain direction you want to come down the handle and down the bowl? That's what I'm doing now. I'm coming down the bowl. I'm actually going across the grain, but I'm going slightly downwards as well. Which is what enables me to take a good smooth cut. So down, across and up. Otherwise you just keep going across, you're going to blow this end, edge of the spoon bowl off. And you end up with a spoon shiller or a spatula spoon instead of a spoon. You won't be able to hold any liquid. And this design is intended for the use of like soup or stews because this is a, a Viking Age inspired spoon. I, I do sell them to reenactors. I'm a reenactor myself, as you may have guessed. And yeah, what do people eat most when they're on reenactment? Stews and soup because it's nice and easy. No, you haven't got the, the equipment with you necessarily to go making a massive, massive roast dinner. So what do you do? Vegetable stew. Off to Asda or Sainsbury's or whatever supermarket in Tesco, Aldi, Lidl is nearby. Get your veg, stick in a big old pot of water, stick it above the fire, cook it up, serve it up, get it in you, feel satisfied, drink some mead, go to sleep. At least that's what I think happens anyway. I haven't actually been to a show yet as a reenactor. Right, I think I'm losing the light out here, so I'm going to have to go in to the kitchen and carry on because I'm starting to struggle to see. And you do need to see what you're doing. So it's all dark and cold in the shed now. It's lovely and warm and bright in here. So I'm going to carry on because I can carve in the kitchen. So there's a couple of ways of doing it when it comes to using the hook knife. I showed you before the potato peeler, and now using a finger push grip where I've got hold of the hook knife in my hand as such. I've got my index finger, if that is the index finger, my index finger stabilizing the push and the pull, as well as these fingers here doing the pushing part. I'm just placing the knife on the edge of it where I want the cut to start. And then pushing it and controlling how much the knife moves through the wood and down, along, and up. Of course, this is not the only way to do it. Like I've said before during this video, there's many ways of doing this. Have a good look around on YouTube. Like I said, Z Outdoors has an excellent channel of all different sorts of different spoon carvers, professional and hobby level, who have different ways of doing this. You also have Spoon Club, that's its own independent website where you've got to, you can sign up and watch this easily over 110 hours of, of footage on there of people spoon carving and doing other things with green woodwork in different ways, it's really good. You also have Rise Up and Carve, 
on Zoom, if you find that on Instagram, then that's a really good resource of information because there's usually someone on there who can give you some advice at some point. It's a worldwide thing, that is, so people could be on there all different times of the day, depending where you are in the world. Now, remember earlier I said about making the back of the bowl as smooth as possible at this point, without it being absolutely perfect? So that is so you can feel between your fingers and your thumbs how much material is still left between them. So you don't want to go too deep just yet with the bowl. So you want to go deep enough so you're not just having to do it all again later. Remember what I said about keeping your thumb, that thumb, tucked away underneath. And also this thumb here is not above the level of the rim. So as the knife is coming up out of the cut, it's not going to cut that thumb. So you feel it's getting a nice, nice sort of thickness there. I can always take a bit more off the back of the bowl or in the inside of the bowl if I would like to. What I'm going to do now is just give it a little smooth out by only taking very small shavings, just taking the peaks off of any any previous cuts, like so. Put the hook knife away. Now I'm going to go back to the back to the straight knife. So remembering what I said about green direction earlier, I'm going to come down there like that and down here and then try and get it to meet in the middle. <clears throat> so, I'm going to use the finger push, keep the, this done, tucked well underneath the bowl, press it into my, into my chest, the spoon, and start the cut going down the grain. I'm going up the grain a little bit there, but that's okay, because I'm kind of going across it rather than directly up it. As long as you're going across the grain, you can kind of go in the opposite direction of which the green is going. It's, it's a funny old thing, green direction. Alright, so that's about the thickness I want there now. So again, going back to the potato peeler grip, I'm going to come down with the green direction, going with the green. Now the thumb's getting a bit close to the knife there, so changing it to the finger push. And just thicker on this side still. So I need to take more material off this side. Taking off little nibbles at a time. Don't want to go too far too soon. Now I'm using a very slow controlled potato peeler grip there. And now I'm going back to the thumb push, finger push. Could use the thumb push if you like. I prefer to use the finger pull or, or a potato peeler grip or the finger push. Take a little bit off here and a little bit off there if you want. So what's happened here now is the bowl has actually got smaller. And I've made the rim a lot thicker. So now I need to draw back on with my pencil so how thick I want the rim of the bowl to be. You don't want it too thick, you don't want it too thin. If it's too thin, it can become sharp and it's uncomfortable in your mouth. If you get it too thick, it's just not, it's not going to scoop anything out of the bowl. It's just going to all roll over the side. So a couple of millimetres seems to be good. That seems like a nice, nice material thickness. Now I'm using the finger push now to go around the curve of the bowl to blend in, take away material from... Well, what I'm actually doing is actually using this finger here as a fulcrum or pivot point and moving the spoon knife or hook knife or crook knife, whatever you want to call it, because it's different names, all the same thing. I'm actually moving moving it around and pivoting off my finger to create that cut. So I'm going to use a potato peeler grip now to go around this side. So I can't use a thumb a thumb push. It just won't work. So use the potato peeler grip to go so far and then change back to the finger push to go down the rest of the way. Because the, the green direction green direction changes a little bit. So you need to be aware of that. And then I've got a little bit here. I'm going to use potato peeler grip just to follow the line. Take a little bit off at a time. And that is a pretty tidy, tidy bowl. Take off a lot of high points now inside the bowl. 
where I can see them. Just feeling now as well around the edge of the bowl just to make sure I'm not going too thin. Feeling inside the bowl just to feel the thickness roughly of where it's going to be. And you want the deep part of the bowl to be here across the back of it and then shallow at the front so the material then you know the stuff you're eating can be held nicely in the in the spoon. At least that's what I've found. You may have a different experience when it comes to the spoons you prefer to eat with. But I found that works quite well. Just tidying up the inside of the bowl now. So I'm going to try and get it to sort of basically finished. So you can really control with the hook knife how much of material you take off. You can do little wispy cuts like this. Or you can take off great big chunks like we were earlier. All depending on how how much pressure or how the angle in which you get the spoon to the knife to engage with the spoon. Bowls maybe the rims may be getting a bit thin by there. I've been taking material off a bit too hastily. So I'm just gonna even it out from the other side. Yeah. One bowl. You can see the knife marks in it, you can see the little facets and there's little bits of wispy shavings left still in there. But that's okay. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfectly smooth. You could use a cabinet scraper, a curved cabinet scraper to get it absolutely minty smooth. But I personally don't bother. It's entirely up to you though. Entirely up to you. That's the bowl hollowed out. A good way of checking to see if you're not going too far as well. If you're sat inside like I am. Hold the spoon and the bowl up between you and the light. And whatever your light source is and see if you can see through it. Or if you're outside, hold it up to the sky and see if you can see through. If you can start to see through, you're going too far. Although you can get some woods fairly thin. And they'll still be good and strong. So what I'm going to work on now is starting to put the facets thin down the handle a touch because it's still quite a chunky handle. Still quite chunky, so I'm going to thin down the handle a little bit, but I want to put some nice facets going down the handle, so I don't want to make it too thin, otherwise it's going to start to become like a sharp edge on the edge of the handle. It's supposed to be a comfortable spoon to hold. You don't want to, it's not a weapon, it's a spoon, you know. using that chicken wing grip which is a good strong motion you can use the entire length of the blade thin down the back of the handle that's a bit nicer yeah that's good I like that you also want the spoon to be strong especially for selling the reenactors because they're quite <laughs> they could be a bit heavy-handed sometimes and the spoon if it's chucked in a, a reenactors bag or someone's box it's going to get bashed about a bit so you want it to be you know have a bit of strength to it now here comes a tricky bit i want to start thinning down the neck so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put facets in along here and here and up there and up there and that will create a little less material for me to take off from them but instead of trying to take all of this off which is difficult and it's just making it hard for yourself make it easy for yourself take off the corners first create some facets like this I tend to do the top of the handle first or you could leave the neck a bit thicker if you like which I might actually do and then cut across take away all those bits of shaving Trying to follow a nice even curve by using the very end of your knife where it's nice and thin using the finger push like this nice and controllable of course the blade is curving towards you but it can't go any further than that that's as far as it can go however doing the other side is a little more tricky because i either have to do a potato peeler or do it as a thumb push i'm going to try the old thumb push and get the knife to pivot around my thumb or pivot off of my thumb and then I can turn around and do the finger push coming down towards the bowl cut that off you see they're slightly different but I can tidy that up as I go just checking to see if they're nice and even 
don't know if I want to make this the neck of this too thin because I want it to be a, a good strong spoon. And it's a little more tricky on the back side by here because I'm going to have a change in grain direction around about there. But if your knife is nice and sharp, it's also definitely not level. Wow. <laughs> oh well. It's a handmade spoon, they're not going to come out like something that's been machine made on a repetition cycle. Now this side, like I said, is a little more tricky because I've got a change in grain direction. So I need to go this way for this curve, but I need to go that way for the neck. So I'm going to try it all going that way. Yeah, it is lifting a little bit. If I just go that far and then lift off out of the cut about here, so I can get a fairly tidy bit of cut going on. And then I can change direction. Come down here. I'll use the thumb push. Might be easier. Yep. And just blend in the chamfer. Going to where we had that change in green direction. And then work the very back corner of the bowl into that chamfer there. It does help as well when the wood's really, really fresh like this is. I mean, it got down, cut down a couple of weeks ago. But it's just been sat in the garden. Hasn't really had the sun on it. winter as well so you're not going to get a lot of hot dry sunshine drying out all your wood. And I see I've got a bit of a sharp point going on here. You see it's come to a nice sharp point these two chamfers meeting. It hasn't on this edge so I'm going to make that happen now so that they're somewhat more equal. Doesn't matter because I'm going to end up taking the material off anyway to make the neck a little thinner. Then I'm going to come back with a finger push and using the tip just take some material off the side of the neck. So now I haven't got as much material to take off as I did before. Try and get a bit of cleaner, crisp yep, connection between the greens in there. You see it's a bit thinner this side now than it is there. So I'm going to come back over here. And just using the tip. Take material away and then come across the grain there to just nip that off. Checking to make sure that the chamfers on the top here are quite even and nice. Because I am looking to get this near to a point of near finish now by doing this. That seems like a nice width. I'll just check it with my. Yeah, that seems like a nice width between my fingers. That's all I can really use as reference is my own fingers. Now it's just a case of going around and tidying up where you've just been for the moment. I'm going to come onto the back of the bowl again in a second. Yeah, that seems pretty nice. So I like to put a bit of a bit of a sweep into the back of the bowl. I don't know if you can see that there. See those lines here and here? I like to put that sort of sweep into the back of the bowl on these. But you need to come up the back of the bowl down the side here because that's the, the best way to do it with the, the green direction. So just nice sort of steady nibbles. Bring it around, trying to take a little bit of material off the back of the bowl here in this back corner so that it's not too thick. It sort of fits in the mouth a bit better as well because if you leave it quite thick by here it just it doesn't quite feel right I find. It's a little more difficult going this way now. I'll just keep taking a, just take a little bit off at a time using the thumb push now I am as you can see. Take a little bit off as you go and just have a look every so often and see where right, I need to come further up. Try to keep the the tip of the knife away from your left hand or your holding hand. Be, try to be as aware as you can about where the tip of the knife is and where the, the rest of the blade is going. It's very easy to cut yourself on doing this. Like I said earlier, if you're a beginner, get some Kevlar gloves, put them on, on the hand that you're using to hold the spoon, checking the feel of it to, make, to try and feel if it's even. Not all spoons are symmetrical. But the ones I like to do usually end up being symmetrical. So I'm trying to achieve that as best I can. 
just keep going back and forth looking at what you looking at what you've got so far and what you've been doing and try and take even amounts off each side if you can so next up i'm going to put the chamfer onto the top of the handle going down the back and along the top and then across the curve at the top so of course going with the green direction the top of the handle you want to come down the handle the back of the handle you want to go down it again you can see it's a little bit uneven on the back of here so i'm just going to even that out by taking some thin quick shavings off like that yep that feels better now i'm just going to get the edge of the knife in just ever so slightly and take a little long chamfer and then just a little more see how the the uh, shaving is coming off and like a long curl just because i'm doing it nice and slow and getting the entire cut and length or cut of the chamfer in one go that's what you want nice curly shavings just have a look down the end of the handle see where you're gonna try and match the angle just a little bit further to start first off to start with not quite getting the length of shaving a lot there so a little bit more until you get to where you want to be if you try to take it all off in one go you're just going to make it difficult for yourself it's going to make it harder Okay, just have another look down the end green, that seems nice. Although that one seems a little shallower than this one. So I'm just going to take a little off the top of this one. That looks pretty nice and even. And then I'm going to do it on the back now. I'm just going to get the edge of, edge of the knife in. Just take a little bit off. Nice long shaving using the chicken wing or just leave a grip and then take that a little bit more off again oh, went, a bit, went a bit strong there <laughs> what I'm going to do now is actually blend the chamfers into the handle so it has like a nice nice curve to it on the back but leave the chamfers nice and defined on the front that's just how I like to do it seems nice so I want to keep the lines of the chamfers on the top because I'm actually going to incise a pattern on the top here with my coal rosing knife which is not in here it's actually out in the shed still should really go and get them so that's the chamfers on the handle now I'm going to even out the bottom of the bowl now I'm going to even out the bottom of the bowl of the rim because I've made it a bit thinner there a bit thinner there than it is around the rest of the spoon so i'm just going to use the, the thumb push just to achieve a bit more of an even thickness on the bottom of the rim going around this way i could do it this way i can't really see what i'm doing i need to see what you're doing so i'm going to use the potato peeler to achieve a little bit more evenness on the bowl thickness now what I could do is try and keep that bo that bowl rim nice and square and flat to the top. What I'm actually going to do is give it a little bit of a chamfer. So I'm going to start off here and come down ever so gently at first and just get it to blend into the chamfer coming down the neck. You don't have to do this. Do it however you want. Do it however you want, because when you're carving the spoon, it's your spoon. Variety is the spice of life. So, and then using the thumb push, just create that chamfer going up the other way. Going with the direction of the grain. If you find that the chamfer is a little bit thick in places, and a little bit thin in others, chances are you can probably even it out. You can always go back into the middle of the bowl with your, with your hook knife if you want to. I'm using the potato peeler grip on this this side because it'll be easier going. Again, little 
hamster nibbles and just look down it every so often just keep an eye on it keep an eye on where you're going how much you're taking off and where try and keep it even but don't create a really sharp edge when you're doing this chamfer you don't want to cut the sides of your lips <laughs> you don't want other people to do it with your spoons either because that really ruins the experience it's one of the first spoons I did like this when I put this chamfer on I put it in my mouth because it was going to be my own spoon I put it in my mouth to test it and I slightly cut the inside of my lips in the corners so definitely don't make it really defined and sharp it's Again, taking little nibbles off here and there, just creep up on where you want to be. Just try and take the high spots off. That's all you need to do, just need to take the high spots off. Just little tiny shavings. You can see there on the edge of the rim I've got a nice bit of uh, a sharp edge going on there, so I want to get rid of that. If I can, get rid of the sharp edge on here, by giving it a bit of a a flat on the between the back of the bowl and the rim of the bowl. Now what I'm going to do is just take off a little bit of the rim, another chamfer of it, from the inside with a hook knife going around the curve of the bowl, just to make it a little bit, a little bit narrower. You don't want too thick of a rim. You don't want it too narrow either. Just taking that a little bit off. Okay. So that's the inside of the bowl done. And then just check around it for anything you may have missed otherwise, which I think I have. I haven't quite got the same amount of blend on the chamfer on the back of the bowl here. So I'm just going to gently work down to that. Okay, that seems pretty nice and even. The sweeps on the back of the bowl here seem pretty even. You can always put a little chamfer along the bottom here, just a teeny one just by using the very tip of your knife just to work around the underside of the bowl there just to take off any any possible sharp edge from there okay oh I haven't done the top here so to do the top again go in upwards just put a nice chamfer on it take away any sharp edges because the sharp edge is also a weak edge So it might even break off and you lose lose a bit of grain and it's going to look a bit a bit ugly possibly and just put a little chamfer on it just to get rid of any sharp edges any sharp corners not only does it look nice it's actually uh, safer and stronger and what I tend to do then is these corners can be a little bit sharp so I just nick the ends off like that and that spoon is ready to go and sit on top of the kitchen cupboard and dry out for a few days and then we'll do the col rosing on the top here and um, do that and then oil it. So it's been a few days now since I last did any carving on the spoon. It's dried out. Here it is. Looking lovely. It's um, I don't know if that's really registering but that sounds drier than it did, you can usually tell by the sound of it, which is a fairly good indicator, although don't take it as absolute. Um, I was thinking of baking this, but I've decided against that because I'm not entirely sure how dry it is. You can bake spoons, so you put like a little thin layer of oil on them, and then you stick them in the oven for an hour and a half or 30 minutes. I forget now, it's been a while since I did it. But unless the spoon is absolutely bone dry, it'll crack. I don't really want that because I put a lot of effort into this and it's quite a nice shape. I'm cool. oh, hello, just chucking it on the floor. Yeah, I'm quite I'm quite liking this one, so I don't wanna I don't wanna purposely ruin it. So I'm gonna uh, I'm only going to cover it. Yeah, that's good. Definitely not too thin on the bowl, which is nice. Uh yeah, so I'm going to do some finishing cuts and then I will put some coal rosing into the top of the paddle of the handle, as I call it, and um, show you how to oil it. So with finishing cuts, it's basically the same thing as I was doing before, where I showed you how to carve different grips and such. So I'm just going to 
go around and find any little bits that I'm not entirely happy with. Like there was a little bit of a lump by there. So I'm just getting rid of that. And then blending it in gently. The rest of the spoon, that's better. I'm looking for any areas, especially around here on the neck of the spoon, of, of any raised grain from where I've had to sort of fight with the grain direction a bit. It's still fighting me even now. It's dried out a bit. Spoons can be um, fun. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It can certainly be a challenge, I'll give them that. I'm not entirely happy with the how equal these curves are. If you hear the occasional whiz pop, it's people setting off fireworks because it's New Year's Eve. And here I am, the party animal that I am, showing you how to carve a spoon. Quite a bit thin there. It's not so thin there, so I'm thinking, take a little bit off there, like so. That might equal it out a bit because that looks wider than that. So this is what I said before about just going around, double checking what you've done just ensuring that what you are doing is uh, nice and equal and symmetrical is dipping in a little bit by there so I'll just take a little bit off the top here a little bit from down there I'm sorry if I'm mumbling I do it a lot okay that looks pretty good just inspecting around the back of the bowl there's a little bit of lifted grain there and I can see that the curves of the the sweeps i put in the back of the bottom of the bowl are not quite equal now one of them's a bit straighter and the other one's more of a curve so try and create a curve on this side because that's where it was a bit more straight so I quite like it to to curve a bit yeah you can see that's a bit more equal now so that's good Add a little bit of a curve up here. Okay. So it's just tiny little, tiny little pieces you're going to be taking off when doing these finishing cuts. You're not looking to do much more in the way of carving a shape. It's more of a, just a little bit here, a little bit there, a pinch of a pinch of it here, a pinch of it there, just to. Just to try and equal things up, you may have missed before, and to just give it a good old tidy up, tidy up that bit. I mean, you could go as far as you want to with this, really. I personally like to leave it a little bit, not like rough, not rough, rough, but I like it to leave. I like to leave evidence of the hand tool that's been there and that it's been done by hand because if things are too kind of perfect. Not that I would think that they're machine made, and you do get people out there who make amazing spoons with hand tools. They really do. Some people, I mean, the workmanship is just incredible. And how these things are not in museums of art, I don't know, but <laughs> they're not. So, and they get used, and they get, you know, soup and cereal and yogurt and... Whatever else you might use a spoon for, mashed potato, and they they have their function and they get used as they should be. I'm one of those sorts of people that don't like things to be made purely for the vanity of it. I like to create functional items, but I do want them to be pretty at the same time. <laughs> right, so there we go. That is I Am Happy. I am happy with the finishing cuts on it. I'm going to give it a bit of a burnish now. But I'm not going to burnish this area here because I'm going to be colorosing or incising a pattern on here, which I've already decided on. Um, I'm not going to burnish that area because I want to burnish it after I've done the colorosing. So this is my burnishing stick. There's a piece of beach dowel, which is however much that diameter is, three quarters of an inch maybe. And it's been rounded on the end, so we're going to go through the inside of the bowl. You use the rounded, the end, it's been rounded nicely to circulate inside the bowl like that. At least that's how I do it. And that will flatten down anything inside the bowl that might be slightly lifted. And then you just go around on all the edges. 
giving it a bit of pressure. You could also use like a nice clean pebble. You could use the back of the metal spoon if you want. Anything that's a sort of fairly sturdy, hard, but smooth and rounded-ish kind of item. You could easily use that for burnishing. I know one, we have one person who uses like a little, a couple of small pebbles they picked out of a river off the riverbed and they work very well for the burnishing that she does. Just get, definitely get on those sharp corners at the top of the paddle with the handle up there, make them nice and rounded and you can definitely feel the difference in the, in the tactility or tactileness, if those are words. I may have just made a couple of words up there. You can definitely feel the difference in how tactile the spoon feels from before burnishing and afterwards. Definitely feels a lot smoother. You'll find that spoons will sort of smooth out a fair bit more with use as well. And the one I use every day and every morning for my cereal, which is not over here. Or is it? No, it's not. Um, that's definitely got a lot smoother over time. Some of the ones that get more re more regularly used for cooking, they've certainly smoothed out a fair bit. It's just what happens, you know, wear and tear. They will get smoother and facets will become less bold. Just get inside the back of the bowl, the inside of the back of the bowl there. Lovely. Right then. Cold rosing time. So, cold rosing. Cold rosing is an old Scandinavian method of incising a pattern into wood, whether it be a spoon, a bowl, or just about anything I'd imagine. Now, I have a cold rosing knife that was made for me by my good friend Phil, who's very often on Rise of and Carve. Phil on Ruak is his uh, Instagram handle. And he made me this knife as well as what well, blah, 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 blah. now he made me this knife along with a chip carving knife which i haven't used yet sorry phil but i haven't got around to chip carving just yet i've been a little distracted with other things but yeah this is the um this is the coal rosing knife that he made me it works really well i really like it so then these things aren't overly expensive i didn't technically pay for this we just sort of met halfway he lives down on the south coast of england I live in the south coast of Wales. We met halfway in Wiltshire. I gave him a load of wood. He gave me two knives and a spoon. In fact, he's given me two spoons over time. And the last time we met, I gave him two spoons to make up for the uh, spoon debt. You'll hear that term getting thrown around a lot on Ruak if you go on there. Ruak is the abbreviation of Rise Up and Calf, but you probably figured that out. In fact, I think there's a little bit of mark there, there which I'm just going to get rid of. So what I've chosen to do, and I've had a little bit of a fiddle, with a few things, I don't know how well you can see them. Had a bit of a play around with some designs. Now I'm going to go for a bind rune. Now when I I realised that bind runes are not technically a Viking Age thing, there's a lot of debate about whether they are or whether they aren't. There is an episode of the Nordic Mythology podcast specifically about bind runes. You can go and watch if you really want to or listen to. Sorry, I don't know if they um have a video from that one. Not sure, but you could definitely listen to it. Now I'm going to go with one that I found on the internet from a few sources, which apparently, is that one there, stands for love, because let's be honest, the world could do with a fair bit more love at the moment. Things are going a little bit odd, shall we say, and I do believe if we could all spread a little bit more love, the world would be a better place. All you've got to do is just lightly draw on, nice and fine, don't make the line too thick. At least this is how I, how I do it. Lightly draw on your pencil line. Use a fairly dark pencil for this. Don't want to lose it too light. A too light a pencil, otherwise you might uh, you might not be able to see what you're trying to incise on your spoon. And just roughly sketch it on. Keep a rubber to hand if you're not happy with the way it's gone. Get the rubber out and rub it off. I'm actually quite happy with that. That's gone fairly well. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I think that looks good. Oh, I haven't got the cinnamon out. So I'm doing this on my kitchen counter. When you go to incise your pattern or bind rune or whatever it is you choose to do, try not to do it on your leg. Or if you are going to do it on your leg, put a piece of wood there or something with a little bit of cushioning, like a folded up beanie hat or a piece of cloth. So you can got something that's going to stabilise that. I'm just going to go and find one of my beanies. So I'm just going to put that 
on there so it's a little bit of cushioning and it won't roll and tip around so much. Now from what I've seen from a demonstration by Lydia Latham who is excellent at coil rosing you want to try and keep your, I don't know how well you can see this, try and keep your coil rosing knife vertical and there's a couple of ways of doing it. You can either start it off that way and push it. I don't like using that method. I like to pull it, pull the knife down but you just get the tip. This is what I'm from what I can gather from watching videos, get the tip in there, try and keep an even good amount of pressure and slowly concentrate on pulling the knife down the line you've drawn on and then stop where you want to stop. So keep it vertical, spot your line Nice even pressure. Don't worry, go off the, if you go off the pencil line a little bit, it's not the end of the world. Especially when you're just doing things like bind rooms, they don't have to be absolutely perfect. Like that. Keep it nice and vertical. Stab it in. Nice even pressure and just draw knife down the line and then stop where you want to stop and then sheath your knife so it doesn't get damaged or it doesn't, doesn't damage you lightly ever so lightly rub out the pencil line and then I can see that that I can see it I don't know how well you can see it on camera that's quite a nice sort of even incision of the pattern. Now this is the part where you want to take your hat away because you're going to be using oil and cinnamon. The cinnamon, ground cinnamon, uh, although you can use any other supermarket, you don't have to use just Morrison's, you can get it from anywhere you like. Um, <clears throat> I use, for oiling, oil from the Good Hemp Company. Not being paid, this isn't an advert, it's just the oil I use because hemp oil is extremely sustainable and no one's allergic to it. Now some people will, like, will use tongue oil, that's perfectly fine. Some people will use walnut oil, I would recommend you don't because some people have an allergy to walnuts and you want to make sure that you tell, if you are going to use walnut oil, make sure you tell whoever is potentially going to buy your spoon that you have used walnut oil on it, just in case. So I'm just going to get a little dab of oil. On there, like that, just a little drop. I'm going to move it around the incision where the incision is, there, like so. Just make sure that that oil is rubbing into the, uh, getting into the incision lines. I will need my burnishing stick for this. And then get your pot of cinnamon with the lid open and just gently sprinkle some on if it wants to. Might just give that a bit more of a more of a shake because there were some fairly big clumps in there. Yeah, that's better. Just gently tap some on. Just give it a little tap, get a bit on there. Get a bit more on there if you want, because what you're going to be doing, come on, it doesn't want to come out of the pot. Cool, I think that should be enough really. And then, I'm going to rub it all around. What will happen then is the cinnamon will mix in with the oil that's gone into the incision. And it'll, and it'll highlight the incision. As you can see, that's nice and dark, those lines now. That's good. It's given a nice dark colour to the spoon around there. Might rub a bit more of it in other places. We'll see. Not everybody likes to taste the cinnamon. And then get your burnishing stick again and give it a good rub over where you've made that incision. And that'll seal it up. And then that ensures that, that cinnamon, or you can use coffee, or some people use charcoal, or whatever it is that you've decided to use, that ensures that that organic material, or whatever it is, stays within that incision. I'm just going to give it a good, properly good rubbing over, just to make sure that it's definitely sealed up because I don't want that stuff coming out. 
There we go. Lovely. And there is your colorosed mark, your incision, your pattern, your whatever you want to call it, and that really gives the spoon a little extra something. Now sycamore is of course a fairly plain wood, so it's not going to, the colour of it is not going to pop too much with the oil. It will have some extra colour to it, but not hugely like beech or cherry does. But all we've got to do with the oiling, as you saw then I poured a nice bit into the bowl, and just start rubbing it around with your fingers. And make sure your hands are clean when you do this, because I have just washed my hands, although there's a little bit of a grey mark there, I'm being very aware of that. And just give it a good, give the oil a good rub in with your fingers. The heat from your fingers will make the oil go that little bit thinner. Just going to get a little bit of that cinnamon and sprinkle it and rub it around here. Just to give that, give it, give it some definition and a bit of colour on the top there. I think that looks nice. Yeah, that will settle in with the grain. Seeing as some of the, the cinnamon that I've rubbed in from the coal rosing has managed to spill over into the rest of the wood, I'm just going to put it on the rest of the top of the handle a little bit underneath maybe, just to give that little bit of extra something. And as I say, just rub your fingers over everything. Hemp oil is actually really good for your skin as well. So... Don't be too hasty to go washing it all off when you're done with this. Let it soak into your skin, it'll feel nice, it'll revitalise and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Moisturise the skin in your hands. But there we go, that is one oiled and coal rosed and finished Birkovic spoon with a lovely binder on the top representing love. We could all do with a bit more, I think. There we go. It's done. It's finished. It's coal rose. It's carved. It's oiled. It's looking lovely, I must say. I do think I've done that coal rosing quite well, so I'm very happy with it. This video will be going out on New Year's Day of 2022. So if you're watching this on New Year's Day, then Happy New Year. And I hope you've had a lovely Christmas and you've all stayed safe and well. And, um,. A little bit of a thing, this is actually the last one of these I'm going to be carving of this particular shape because I've made a new template. Now this one is slightly different and slightly the same, weirdly. The bowl is basically the same shape but the handle is obviously different. You can see from the template there, it's going to be coming a little in a little bit on the handle right before the, uh, on the neck, sorry, right before the bowl. But I'm going to be carving them this way from now on as well. It's a little bit narrower here so I can do some sort of different cull rosing and stuff. And it'll be a little bit easier to carve as well, because as you all saw, carving these back here can be a bit of a pain. Especially when it's not quite the even itself. So every of these Berkovic, this is Berkovic Spoon version 3, I'll be carving will be of this shape. This is the last one of these I will have done. So if you'd like to buy it, contact me via Instagram. I don't really use Facebook very much anymore. I will post a video link to this on Facebook, but... It'll be Instagram is the best way of getting hold of me. So, yeah, there we go. One Viking Age inspired, inspired, uh, eating spoon made from sycamore. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank everyone who has been watching the videos that I've been putting up and who's been following me on Instagram and Facebook. As I say, I don't use the Facebook thing very often. It's more Instagram I tend to be on, but thank you to everyone who's been following me all year long. And hopefully 2022 might be a little bit easier going, shall we say, than the last couple of years have been. But less of that. I hope you all have a lovely new year and you drink plenty, you've eaten plenty and you've seen your loved ones. And I hope you're all safe and well. And again, thank you for watching the videos and all the likes and comments and subscriptions. I really do appreciate it. So hopefully it won't be uh, too long before I make the next video. And I'll try and make it a little bit shorter as well. <laughs> this is a bit of a long one. But yes, Happy New Year and stay safe and well. I'll see you all soon.